Good morning, everyone. I'm Bear Shirazi. Uh, right now at Acquia. Hello, some familiar faces here. And I'm here to talk to you about how do you better understand your jury. And by the jury, I mean everyone. You know, your own team, your client side, your business sponsors, your client side development team, your partners, etc. etc. Uh, how many people here have seen 12 Angry Men? Yeah, so you're going to be familiar with this concept. So usually what happens is you've got an idea, you're in a room, you're the only guy who sees sense, and then how do you convince the audience or the jury to come onto your side of the table or the fence? I'll be talking about a tool. There are many tools to do so, but I'll be focusing on one of my favorite tools. It's called Empathy Maps. How many people here have heard of Empathy Maps? Cool, okay. So, <coughs> empathy maps are, is, is, is one of the tools you can use to understand your jury or understand your audience. One of the reasons that I love it is because it can be used at you know, 35,000 feet or right down onto the ground. So, everything starts, good design, or everything starts with a methodology. If you don't have a method, you don't have a way of doing things, you can't plan it out, it's not going to work. In the most basic form, a methodology would take you through a process of discovery, a process of de definition, and a process of delivery. A good methodology is one that encompasses the entire life cycle. And Empathy Maps is one of those rare tools that actually does encompass the entire life cycle. That's what an Empathy Map essentially looks like. So what you've got is the situation, so your current state, and you've got your future state over here. Then you put down a persona, which is very different from what we usually hear personas are. Uh, when, when we think about design agencies and personas, we, we look at demographics. In empathy maps, a persona isn't exactly a demographic. It's an individual. It's an organization, as opposed to saying, you know, 23-year-old student from Brighton University. You're going to say a student, uh, you know, John Smith, with this problem. So it's more specific to an individual or an organization. Then what you do, then you've got the individual's pains and what are you going to provide in terms of relief. And to get to the pains, you've got to look at what they hear, what's called the noise. Ah, I'm skipping slides. I always do that. Um, I assume everyone over here knows what empathy is as opposed to sympathy. Right, so I'll jump this. Okay, so the current state is where your subject or your organization or your target is right now. Their persona, the transform state, and how do you get to the transform state? That's something that you're going to discover in the process of discovering their pains and what the different uh, relief points for them are. And I'll talk you through this example in a minute. Then, to get to that, to get to their pain, you've got to see what they first hear in, in their ecosystem. What's, what's the noise in their ecosystem? What they see in their ecosystem, i.e. what their view is. Then, what they think and feel, i.e. their belief that comes from what they hear and what they see. And then, what their behavior is, so what they say and do. Once we know these four different quadrants, we can figure out what their pain is, and we figure, can figure out what their relief is. And then we can start addressing their issues. So in this example, for instance, what we've got is a photographer. I'm using an example of a bit of work that I did for Canon a while ago. Uh, so the situation is we've got a persona here, which is an individual whose dilemma is, which DSLR do I choose? There's so many out there. The situation is they're drowning in noise because they're overloaded with data. So there's Sony saying, hey, we've got a DSLR with interchangeable lenses, it's compact. Uh, you've got mobile phones that have you know, quality just as good as a DSLR these days, they're far more convenient than carrying a big DSLR around. So these are things that are affecting this individual's behavior. And the behavior and the pain of their behavior is it's a mountain of data, they're confused as to what choices they should be making. 
the, cha the technology landscape is continuously changing, so there's more and more data that is being thrown at the individual, which is affecting their buying decisions. Where we want to get to, obviously we want to get them to buy cameras, but where we want to get to is consistent brand messaging across all channels. So regardless of which channel they look at, there's always one consistent message coming from a single company, the company we're talking about right now. Now how do we get there? So what would be the relief? The relief would be informed choice, consistent messaging. Uh, we've got things like personalized training. These, these are the things that we've discovered after we looked at their pains and what they say and do, what their behavior is. So just to take you very quickly through it. So for instance, what they hear, the noise they're hearing is that Sony is the new Canon. Uh, Canon is the most popular brand, but is it the best? So the brand messaging isn't consi consistent. So that's making them question the strength of the brand itself. Camera is not important. The creative side is. That's another thing that we heard uh, when we went out and did, did the research. And Canon's after-sales support is amazing. So in terms of how you do this research, we actually went out and spoke to people. We spoke to professional photographers. We spoke to individuals quite literally on the street outside. Uh, Jessup's looking to buy cameras. So getting to this data is field research. Now, compare this to how you develop personas. Traditionally, and even now, most people develop personas sitting in a room. So you go, OK, so my target audience is you know, A1. This is the income bracket. You know, wife and two kids. What you're missing out is you're not really talking to an individual as to what their pains are. You're just assuming that there's this clone, you know, this stamp that we can take across different markets, and that's going to help us understand what the market needs are. Uh, me and a lot of people who believe in empathy mapping would like to differ. It doesn't work. The only way to understand your audience and empathize with them is to actually engage with them and ask them for their pains, their problems, what they're here. A lot of this is observational. So we won't go out and ask them questions like, hey, what's your pain as a photographer? We, we'll go and ask them about what they're hearing in the market. We'll go and ask them, what do they see? Uh, how, do, how do competitors compare to uh, you know, their target brand? Because when you go out to buy something like a DSLR, you have a brand in mind. You have one or two brands in mind. You don't just walk into a shop and say, I'm going to pick up this 1100 pound camera because uh, it looks nice. You do your research. And that's what we're trying to get to, is where does their research come from? A lot of it now is social. It's always been social, but access to social now is far easier than it used to be. Still jumping slides. So after that, we asked them, what do they see in the market? So one of the things that came out was brand snobbery, for instance, which was an interesting one for us. They're like, I'd never buy any car. Why not? Canon to Canon. Yeah, but have you compared the features? Uh, no, I'm going to go with a Canon. Okay, why is that? Because my mate's got a Canon, everyone I know has got a Canon. What they should be really looking at is, has your mate got a Canon with lenses that he can spare for you, or can you pick up cheaper lenses? Because the DSLR body itself is the cheapest part of buying a DSLR. So if you're getting into serious photography, your main expense is going to come from all the different lenses that you're going to have to buy. Then we looked at what they hear, what they see, and how does that make them feel? So how does it affect their belief system? So we came across things like, I expect support in real time. I share photo for people to see me. Price point matters. What's the greater value? These are the kind of things they started believing in. So it wasn't cheap that they were after. They were after good value. Uh, they were after support. They recognized that. A DSLR has more functions these days than most of us have the time in our entire lifetime to get a handle on. So they're looking for support, they're looking for, how can I get to something that I want to do really, really quickly? So for instance, uh, Nikon, a lot, a lot of brands have bite-sized learning videos now. So if you want better aperture control, you just go somewhere on a website, on a blog, and you've got a two-minute video that teaches you something. You're not going to sit down and read through a manual. That was one of the pains as well. Is how do I get to all the features without reading the manual? So for instance, Sony is really good at this, because everything's there on the camera. You don't really need to go to the, to the manual. 
Uh, then we looked at their behavior. So which camera should I buy or which camera should I upgrade to? Uh, I show you my post-purchase experiences. You should definitely get this Nikon D3100, I swear by it. These, these are the kind of behaviors that started coming out from camera, potential camera buyers and those who are looking to upgrade. Then we looked at the brand itself. So we, we got the view of the individual. Now we said, okay, let's look at the brand. So we went and talked to product owners within the brand, and Canon does everything from like you know medicine, medical machines, scientific machines to, to printers. So this is specifically talking to people at Canon regarding the SLRs, not even their other camera brands uh, ranges. So we asked them, what's your what's your pain point? What's your situation? And we found that the situation is exactly the same as the end user who's suffering from inconsistent brand messaging, their problem, their pain point, their current situation was the same as well, which is we've got so many channels, we've got so much con content out there, how do we make it all consistent across all the different channels, across all the regions? So what is Canon here? So they hear the scary stuff at a macro level. Sony's gonna hit us, mobile phones, are going to completely take this market over. So for instance, Samsung's got a phone, came out with a phone two years ago with a retractable lens. I'm pretty sure you know, you'll have phones coming out with replaceable lenses. <coughs> Another serious issue for, for this company at that time was connected cameras. They weren't looking at connected cameras. So we started talking to them about connected cameras. And light bulbs went out in the room and they were like, wow, we should have been thinking about this. Well, they're late to the game, but yeah, now, as of about two years ago, they, they jumped into that sphere as well. So what do they see? Customers are fickle than ever before. So swapping brands is really easy. One of the reasons cited for swapping brands was eBay. You know, previously it was really difficult flogging off your 3,000 pound camera, but eBay makes life a lot easier because they can still get a lot of value for their old machine and they can sell off and move to another brand. Uh, which experiences will improve our relationship with customers? This for us was a surprise, they were asking us which experiences will improve their relationship with their customers even though they have one of the best after-sales support services out there. Uh, what they see, they're losing the compact mar camera market to smartphones. Um, that one, of the, one of the things that they were looking at at that point, which from, in our opinion, was very creative, was they were in a red sea. So they were looking for a blue ocean. They are like, where can we go where competition isn't so brutal? And the market they decided to look at was the kids. They're like, hey, you know, kids like cameras. Most of our, those of us who have kids know that our kids go around, you know, wrecking our phones. So they're like, why don't we come up with a range of cameras for kids? And that, for them, turned out to be the blue ocean. Uh, still a growing market. So taking them onwards, where should they be? Their future state is consistent brand messaging. Um, the gains or the relief to their pains was consistent brand messaging, personalized customer experience, and consistent uh, customer touch points, or content touch points, as we call them. Because you see why this leads into content strategy later on. Because at the end of the day, brand messaging is all about content, regardless of which channel you're looking at. So, empathy maps allow you to have the macro view, so you can look at the organization, i.e. Canon. You know, right out from space, you can see the entire ecosystem. That empathy map isn't just relevant for Canon, it's across the board. You can just replace the brand for anyone. The, the, all pain points would probably remain the same. It's an 80-20 rule. Most of their pain points are those shared by their competitors as well. And then you can have a micro view as well. So you can get down right to the parts of the individual. That's your target market. One of the other reasons I love empathy maps, and I love using them in almost every engagement I have an opportunity to, is it's not, uh, 
it's, it's technology or platform agnostic. So for instance, this is an entity map done for an NGO on reducing poverty and radicalization. So you're taking a map, a, a tool from the digital realm. Empathy maps, by the way, were developed by a company called Xplain. Uh, they're a digital agency back in the late 1990s, I think, or early 2000s. <coughs> so empathy maps you can use to get a pulse on and understand big brands. You can use it to understand radicalization. And you can use it to understand poverty. You can, under you can use it pretty much to understand any target jewelry that you want to, regardless of you know, what we do for a living. It's a tool. It's a tool for thinking. That's essentially what it is. It's simple to use. It's non-prescriptive. Uh, that's, that's what makes it extremely flexible, that it is non-prescriptive. You can use it, you, you can deep dive as much as you need to. So for instance, you could develop an NP map on a day's research, or you can spend an entire year researching a particular target audience. So what's in it for me? You know, that's the big question when, whenever I talk to clients about NP mapping, and it is, once again, it's hard job convincing clients to spend time empathy mapping to understand their audiences that they think they already understand because they've been in that market and in that business for you know, a bazillion years. It, it helps you understand the footprint <coughs> of your audience and of your ecosystem. It helps you understand, it helps you chart your individual target audience or your customer's journey through your business, there, through your business's life cycle or the product life cycle. It's their interaction with content. That's what drives our interest in empathy mapping because it helps us identify where and how individuals are going to engage with content. So coming back to the example of consistent brand messaging, the problem wasn't inconsistent brand messaging, it was having content that is accessible to everyone across multiple channels in your marketing and your communications department. So that brings us to something called content touch points. So every, folks here familiar with um, customer touch points? Yeah? So this is like building on cus customer touch points are essentially all the places where your customer is going to come into contact with your brand. So if you're Coca-Cola, your customer touch point is the kiosk outside that's selling Coke, or it's the football club that's sponsored by Coke, or it's the TV advert with Santa Claus on those trucks. So anywhere where you see Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola's touch point. Anywhere where you consume content is a company or an agency or a newspaper or anyone's content touch point. So it's just the, the concepts are pretty much the same. Um, what we say is instead of the customers uh, you know, interacting with your brand, we say take a step back, it's not your brand that the customer is interacting with, it's the content that you're pushing out on the channel that your customer is interacting with. It dictates our content strategy. And that's what our interest is. So what's in it for me is the whole point of developing content strategy that is based on understanding your customer or your audience like you've never done so before. And once you can sell this concept to your clients that like, if you go through this exercise, yes, you'll have to pay us for it. We're not gonna do it for free. But if you go through this exercise, we'll be, we'll be able to help you discover your customer, uh, your customer's content needs better and hence drive your content strategy <clears throat> to be more effective, they will buy into it. So just to take you through this, so for instance, this is content touch points for buying a camera. Uh, these blue dots over here, these are offline decision points. So the first thing is, I have a need, I wanna buy a camera, because without the need there's no, there's no diagram here. So I wanna buy a camera, where do I go? So I start my research. So my next phase as an individual, you buyer, is I start my research. So my first protocol here is going to be the company's website to look at the product catalog. Then I'm gonna to go to comparison sites. I am gonna to go to blogs. I'm going to go socials. I'm gonna ask my friends, I'm gonna ask my family, I'm gonna ask uh, the photographer, the keen photographer friend that I have. 
hey, which brand do you use? I'm thinking of buying this camera. I'm thinking of spending four grand on a camera. Do I really need to? Or <coughs> is my mobile phone just good enough for my needs? Then there's the point of selection. So after you've done your research, you've made a decision, and then you go to the point of selection. See, so once again, you visit comparison websites for price checking. You visit online stores, you visit offline stores, showrooms, dealer stores, you visit social again. So you'd say, okay, I'm looking at a basic Nikon D500. Uh, I know, my nephew's got a D500 and he's just upgraded his camera, so I really need to buy it brand new, or can I just get it socially? Can I go and buy it from a friend, family, etc., etc.? After you've made the selection decision, you're gonna make a purchase, and once again, You've got multiple choices in where you actually purchase it. So for instance, if I buy it from the dealer showroom for the brand, they get a higher margin. So it's in their interest to drive me to the dealer showroom and make my purchase there as opposed to on eBay. Um, after I've made my purchase, receiving the goods in itself is a content touch point as well. So when I get the camera, do I, what kind of packing, packaging is it in? What kind of help material does it come with? Is there a big fat manual that's gonna sit on my shelf collecting dust till I decide to throw it away four years later? Or does it come with a simple thing saying, go to this website, you can find out everything about this camera and how to use it. Then I start using it. And the moment I start using it, you'll see that I start generating content and I start consuming content. So suddenly it becomes a dialogue and it goes absolutely crazy because if, if I can't use the camera, I'm gonna moan and complain about it on Twitter and all the social feeds. If I'm loving the camera, I'm gonna do exactly the same. I'm gonna visit video blogs, I'm gonna to go to YouTube, I'm gonna try and find every bit of information about making me a better photographer using that piece of equipment as is possible. Then comes the maintenance phase, which kind of like sits between the two so whatever I use, whichever blog I go to to figure out how do I better harness the aperture feature, I'm probably going to go to the same blog to find out how do I, what's the best way, the safest way for me to clean my lens? Or what kind of filters should I be using? Once I start using it, I also become an advocate. And once again, this is part of this, this column here, I start generating a lot of content as well. And this is where companies are getting really clever on how to turn us into their content team, how to take content from us and then pitch it back to us. You know, and this is where we come in you know, as transformation specialists, where this is where we can guide them and help them understand how you don't need you know, a colossal content generation team because you already have thousands and thousands of content creators, you just need to harness them. You need to make sure that you pick out the right ones and you turn them into champions. Or, like a lot of companies don't engage with negative bloggers. You know, they try and hide away from negative bloggers. For me, that's a valuable source of information as well because if you can convert the negative blogger into a positive one, then that individual holds more value for your brand as a messaging channel than someone who's always singing your laurels. After you're done with the ad advocacy, you might decide you're gonna Upgrade or you might decide you're gonna abandon. And once again, if you decide to upgrade, we go back to all of those content channels. And how do we guide the user? How do we guide a potential buyer onto the next model that we would like him or her to buy? As opposed to them going and making a decision on them by themselves. So how do you influence your audience through your different content channels? Yeah, ranging from TV adverts to stores to kiosks to whatever. Uh, over here, once again, you've got a decision point. Am I gonna buy, am I gonna upgrade? Uh, I'm gonna buy another one, upgrade, and am I going to switch brands? So if you've got consistent messaging, if you've got a clear cut content strategy, you can influence all of these channels and you can influence that individual's decision point on how they engage, when they engage, whether they buy into your sales spiel or not. Everyone with me so far? Any questions? Please. Um, can you explain the difference between the, the noise and the view? Because they seem to be very similar to me. Mm. Uh, okay, so the view is what you see. 
So for instance, I see Coca-Cola plastered everywhere. And the noise is what I hear, so Coke is really bad, fizzy drinks are really bad for me, which is not really noise, it's a fact. Um, so it, we separate out on our senses, so it's a sensory division. So stuff we see, we tend to believe it more strongly than stuff we hear. So for instance, um, WMDs, if we saw them, we'd truly believe them. But we heard them, that shaped our belief, but then we saw something completely different once we had boots on the ground and then we had our own people saying, guys, they don't exist. So that's the, the key difference. When you see something, your view, you have a much more stronger opinion about it as opposed to when you hear. So hearing is hearsay. So I can hear that, yeah, Coke is really bad for me, but do I buy into it? Not really, because I my breakfast is Diet Coke. It's awful, but it is. Until I see something God forbid something happens to me and my GP says, dude, it's Diet Coke that's to blame, then my belief that Diet Coke is bad for me is going to be much more stronger than just hearing about it. Does that help it? Is there a equivalent for touch? Because that should be even more powerful. <laughs> yeah, there should be. I think after then I'm going to start working on evolving the model. How do you engage with touch? But I think touch will probably fall into scene because that's how we interact with our devices these days. But yeah, you've got a very valid point there. There should be something on, on, on the physical side as well. Should it be something to do with seeing this like experience rather than uh, be told or understand or something? Yeah, I just I have the same feeling as I think these guys that limiting it to vision and hearing is a little confusing in the way that People can ex people can experience things in different ways, different senses. So to that, what I sort of get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the experience, if, if I just go <laughs> back, in terms of the experience, that's where this sits. <coughs> so that's my thinking and my feeling. That's what I've experienced. That's what I've learned. That's the knowledge <coughs> that I'm carrying, and I'm doing so because. I've heard about stuff, so I'm hearing from multiple channels, the TV adverts are telling me Diet Coke will make me sexy and more likable by the ladies, and I'm seeing that it's not really working, you know, because I have a ginormous meal and I have Diet Coke and I'm still not losing weight. So my experience is that fizzy drinks with the diet label on it don't really work, right? So your experience kind of comes from what you're thinking and feeling, and then you share that experience by what you say and do. So like me standing here dissing Diet Coke when I'm gonna go out and buy another can off it straight after. I want this to be more interactive. I don't have a whole lot of slides on this, so please. Otherwise, it'll be pretty boring. Many ones with lots of rising that's how they actually turn up. <clears throat> I mean, it's really terrible to put it up on a slide, but that's how an empathy map will actually turn up. And when you start developing an empathy map, there'll be way, way more writing on this because you're gonna capture everything, every little thing that an individual says, and you're gonna have multiple empathy maps. So when we're doing our research, what we do is we would have one empathy map for the one individual we've spoken to. And then we will also look at that persona. When, then we'll merge all our empathy maps. And we'll find that a lot of these things are consistent. Though they've been said differently, they pretty much mean the same. That's where you kind of filter out the noise. Uh, when we're building the empathy map, we have a lot of noise. We filter out the noise, assimilate all our different maps into one. And they are very, very busy tools. Um, if you don't have a lot, that your audience is telling you, if you have an empathy map that is pretty much like two things here, two objects here, two things here, two things here, your research is incomplete. Because if I was to go out and ask someone, how do you feel about uh, upgrading your DSLR? And you said, yeah, it's okay. I think I'll buy it next year. And I put that down over here. And I said, what do you see in the market about DSLRs? And you say, yeah, they got good adverts. And I just walked away with that. I'm not really digging into stuff. So for example, if we look at the macro level empathy map, this one's harder to build because you're talking to the institution, the company. 
and they don't share a lot. It's a lot more difficult to get information out of them. So these maps, organizational empathy maps, are usually less busy and they take, surprisingly, they take more time and investigation to develop than building an individual's empathy map. Because individuals, well, if you're not very talkative, I'm gonna move on to the next one. But if you're the only product, manager, product owner that's been assigned for my research and you're not very talkative, well, I've got to figure something out and make you talkative. You know, whether that's uh, not using the empathy. Like, another thing is, we don't put this in front of the users. Because the moment you put this in front, they start boxing stuff in themselves. So what we do is have these conversations at different points. So we run a workshop and say, okay, we want to, we want to talk to you about your experiences within the company about uh, brand messaging. So what is it that you and your colleagues, you know, what is it that your peers and colleagues tell you, provide you information, feedback on brand messaging that comes out of your content department? So we, come, we talk to the communications team, we talk to the product owner, we talk to the marketing team. Um, as many teams as we can find, we usually run a collective workshop at the end of it, and that's where we present this. And then we have to rejig it, because when we present this, we plaster it on the walls. And we say, OK, you've got a couple of empty, <coughs> empty maps. You've got a couple of ones that have been populated by the research we've conducted. Here are some sharpies. Go crazy. And then you get more information coming out of those debates. They will challenge you on stuff that they've set themselves. You know, so for someone who says, I think our customer service sucks, in a group setting, they're not going to exactly say that. They're going to say, hang on a second. I'm from customer services, and I'm telling you, we're one of the best in the market. But at that point, you've got to investigate and say, okay, so you're saying there's no room for improvement. Of course, there is room for improvement. So compared to the best, you are the best, but you could be better, right? So in some ways, it sucks because you're, you're benchmarking yourself against yourself. And that is not really you know, a quantitative metric that you can use uh, going forward. Any other questions? Um, are there different research methods that fit better with the four different quadrants? For example, a user testing might be better for say and do, but interviews might be better for think and feel. Absolutely. And it depends on the audience. You know, so for instance, when we were doing research for an NGO, we couldn't use any scientific method as such because we were out there in the field talking with people who wouldn't spare us more than a couple of minutes and we had to ask them short, sharp questions and then move on because we were researching extremism and radicalization and poverty, the link to poverty for it. But when you're in a more formal setting, you can lean on, um, you can lean on other tools. So for instance, on Think and Feel, Rich Pictures is one of my favorites. Uh, you folks know Rich Pictures? Okay. Rich Pictures is essentially a diagram of the ecosystem. You know, so you go, okay, so let's start with the camera brand in the middle. What affects this? There are the phone brands that affect it. For instance, one of the things that we suggested was just an idea. Why don't you guys sell your lenses to Samsung and uh, you know, the other phone manufacturers? And once again, they're like, I not really thought about that. Well, why not? Because you're not really competing with them you know, in, in the lens space because they're not in the lens business, but you are you could probably come up with a way better lens to fit my mobile phone camera than most of the phone, mobile phone manufacturers can because that's not where they're spending their money on R&D. They're just picking up uh, off-the-shelf solutions for their lenses, for instance. So the lens on my Nexus sucks, the lens on my iPhone 6 is awesome. You know, so maybe Nexus can learn from that and pick up a manufacturer who has a better lens. So yeah, you can use different tools and models. So Rich Picture I've used for Think and feel and say and do because it gives you an overview of the ecosystem. Uh, this is one of the harder ones, the current situation, because every individual you talk to has a different current situation. So what you end up with is a lot of information. And if you look at it, everyone's current situation should be represented. But you've got to pick the bigger items. Uh, in terms of Seeing, if you're looking at, for instance, the audience of a digital publication, then yeah, you could use scientific methods, user acceptance testings would definitely sit in there. Um, so I'd use different techniques. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd imagine that seeing here, you'd have to gather that implicitly from what you're getting from saying, doing, thinking, feel. 
because Correct. kind of what the what the person is hearing and seeing, you have to get that implicitly from what they're saying and doing. Yeah. Um, rather than being able to measure it in a Absolutely. way. Absolutely. This is where our interview takes us, right? Because yeah. when we talk to them, this is what they do. It's their behavior. Then you've got to decipher whether they're saying it or whether they heard it and it's hearsay and they're just passing it on. Or whether their belief is based on something that they've actually seen and felt and experienced themselves or is it based on hearsay. So a lot of the information we will gather will sit here initially. <coughs> then we've got to decipher, okay, is this stuff you really heard or is this stuff you actually saw? Is there something you engaged with? So someone might say, hey, Bitly is awesome. You know, I use Bitly all the time. Okay, so it sits in both. And you will have messages that do sit in both, but then you've got to weigh them and say, okay, this guy uses Bitly, that's why he's saying Bitly is amazing. Or has he just heard Bitly is amazing? So the question would be, if I was to say, Bitly is pretty cool, have you used it? No. How do you know it's cool? Kubera uh, uses it. Tells me the best. Okay, cool. So, what you heard Kabir say has influenced your belief system. That means that individual or that channel holds a higher index value. Which brings us back to our content touch points. So, part of our investigation or our research will help us align these over here. So which channel is more important to the individual? So for instance, over here, they are ranked. The most important channel, the, the one that most users said they would rely on and would completely believe in, was the company's actual website, because it's such a strong brand. Now if it wasn't such a strong brand, maybe it'd be a blogging site, maybe it'd be a price comparison site. So you start indexing your different channels. So for instance, when buying a £4,000 camera, social doesn't really carry that much weight, which was a surprise to us. So we thought, hey, hang on a second. If you were one of the best photographers and I knew you and you told me to go and buy this brand, would I buy this brand? Maybe I would, maybe I won't. But what I'd probably do is go back to the website and try and tally what you've told me against other bloggers and what the company has to say itself. Yeah? And that, that point you made about getting someone else to make the lenses, um, or to sell the lenses rather, I mean, that, that wouldn't come out of this process, because this is purely sort of descriptive. That's something that you guys had the, the kind of light bulb moment about, isn't it? Yep. So this, this is it's sort of really create, sort of creative. It's sort of, does it just present the environment where creative ideas can come out, rather than actually, it doesn't really find creative ideas per se, does it? it, it both of those statements are true. So for instance, um, it does create an environment which helps creativity, but at the same time, it, it, is, it, it, gets, it gets your audience thinking in a different way. So it helps their creativity as well as ours. So when they tell us what their problems, their issues are, what their red ocean is, for instance, like the lens thing came out by saying, hang on a second, there was a product owner in charge of lenses, and he told us that he's in charge of lenses, so we're like, where do you sit in this picture? And he's like, well, we, we white label and sell lenses as well, so I don't really sit anywhere. You know, I'm in a happy place, I'm not in a red ocean, because you know what, we make some of the best lenses in the world. And if you're going to go for the best in the world, you're gonna to come to us. So I'm not in the same problem space as these guys are, because they're scared of, scared of mobile phones, they're scared of Sony coming up with cameras that are compact and as powerful as our big machines are. That's where the light bulb moment came, hang on a second, so why don't you sell mobile phone companies your lenses? So it, it, it helps bring down a lot of barriers. Because what you have is when you see, when you put a group of people in a room and say like, all of you individually told us some of this stuff, suddenly a lot of people say, yeah, I agree with that, I don't agree with that, and you get the debate going. That stands true for the organization because everyone in these big companies works in silos, and this gives you an opportunity to not only bring them in a room, because once you get people in a room, the most difficult thing to do is to get them to talk, as I'm experiencing right now. <laughs> yeah? But once you get them in a room and you say, this is the stuff you've told us individually, 
suddenly that barrier you know, comes down a level. It doesn't disappear, but it drops down a few bricks. Steve, you were going to say? So I was saying three minutes. Three minutes. Cool. <laughs> Please. Um, on the earlier slide, you were talking about the situation um, and how it's, um, it's key to have as much data in there as possible. Um, how do you collate that data? Because realistically, you can't have every every case possible in, in that situation. So how do you kind of target what's the, the most? The biggest issue? Yeah. Uh, simple statistics. So we spoke to 80 people, and most of them said, for instance, this is well, the one for poverty. Working poor, vulnerable, marginalized, and they're desperate for change. And now an increasingly intolerant worldview. That was their current situation. So when we spoke to them about a range of topics, those were the themes that we got out from them. Let me just go back to. I guess where my question is, is, is there a process similar to the empathy maps to kind of collate those statistics and figure out what is of highest importance and priority? Yeah, you, you, you do, you do, we do use statistics. When we capture all of this data, one of the first things we do is we group them. We group them into issues. And then we say, okay, how many people actually have this issue? Is it big enough to go on the board? When, it's, when it comes to the organization, we usually put all the issues on the board because you don't get a lot of issues from the organization. Uh, even as individually, they're fairly cagey. You get, the issues come up when you put them in a room as a group. But when you're interviewing and researching with individuals, you take their issues and you group them, and you say, okay, do the majority of people have this issue? So for instance, over here we've only got one situation, which is data overload, making decisions by and, and remain with a particular brand a hard choice. So that came through a range of different statements from people, but we could group that all into data overload and remaining with a particular brand. So brand loyalty was an issue for people. They weren't as loyal as they used to be. Cool. Any other questions? I've got the blank empathy maps and the sample empathy maps on my blog, uh, which is shirazi.com, so feel free to go and download them and play around with them. There's no, one of the reasons I love this tool is it's non-prescriptive nature, so you can't really go wrong with it. It's a very simple tool to use. Uh, try using it with your own, within your own team. Yeah, so I've used it within my own teams previously, uh, trying to get to developer issues, for instance. So what are the key things that pain, what are the key pain points for my development team, for instance? So I do that. Just play around with it before you decide to take it to a client. And do find a willing and able client that you can experiment with this. Because at the end of the day, it is an experiment. Any tool we do use with a client <coughs> is an experiment. It may or may not work for the client. You know, the, the success rate of that experiment is going to come from how many times we've experienced using that particular tool, right? So, that's it. <laughs> and lastly, I always have to plug this, so please do follow, check them out. It's Bring Peace Through Prosperity. It's a, it's a site pet project. I won't call it a pet project because it kind of like consumes us completely. But it's about trying to reduce radicalization, extremism in society in all its form, regardless of whether it's been blamed or ascribed to a god or to immigration or to whatever. But how do you turn our world in a better place for ourselves and future generations to come? It's quite topical. Plus, if we can't empathize with our fellow human beings, then we have no hope in hell. Thank you.